Thank you. Thank you. Bonjour. How are you feeling this morning? Yeah. How about waving your hands in the air like you care? Woo! Awesome. Thank you. I'm really excited about this conversation, and we're going to do this a little bit differently um, in terms of time. We want to get a lot of questions to this amazing panel. So instead of asking them for their bios and their organizational names um, or, or reading their bios, I'm, I'm asking them uh, three hard questions right from the top. Who are the people that your work supports? Where are those people located? And number three, what strategies do you do, uh, do you deploy to uh, support those people? How about we start at the end, Julien? And make sure you have your transceivers, because this will be bilingual. I'm going to be speaking in French, so just uh, if you need the, uh, the equipment, it's somewhere in the room. Uh, alors, merci pour la question. Um, donc, si je reviens sur, ce, sur ces différents points-là qui ont été abordés, donc les personnes qu'on qu appuie, ce sont tout simplement les communautés uh, à travers l'Ontario. Uh, notre organisation, on a six bureaux, on essaie d'être vraiment une organisation qui est enracinée uh, à travers la province pour travailler justement au mieux possible avec ces communautés-là. Euh, comment est-ce qu'on développe le, le, ces groupes de personnes-là? Souvent, c'est en leur faisant prendre conscience qu'il euh, y a des choses qu'on ne sait pas et il faut savoir identifier les choses qu'on ne sait pas et peut-être on peut amener un fragment de connaissances supplémentaires à ces personnes-là, surtout autour de la prise en considération du fait euh, qu'il est possible de changer les choses lorsqu'on a euh, les ressources, les outils, euh, le matériel nécessaire pour changer les choses. Et dans certains cas, on peut amener euh, ce matériel nécessaire. Awesome, and um, remember that these fascinating people, their bios are all on, in your kits, they're online, if you want to learn more about them, Julie and Jeremy. Let's go to you now, uh, Priyanka. Um, tell us, uh, Priyanka Lloyd, um, how do you do your work? Where, where are your people? Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, so we are a national nonprofit uh, with a mandate to support communities and businesses across Canada. Uh, we currently support a network of seven what we call green economy hubs in Ontario that work with businesses, mostly small and medium-sized organizations, to transition to the low-carbon economy. Uh, the way these hubs do that is work with these local businesses to measure their environmental impacts, set long-term reduction targets, and publicly report on progress. Uh, and businesses are supported in achieving their goals by um, being connected to a network of other businesses where they can learn from one another, getting one-on-one -on -one support from the hub, uh, and being celebrated in the community for the progress that they're making. And uh, next we're going to hear from Ali Abaya. Tell us, uh, tell us all about your work. Thank you. Good morning. So I'm here representing Alterna Savings, an amazing credit union, and I come from as the director of community impact. And what that means is, Alterna has a huge portfolio that supports nonprofits and charities specifically. It's about 460 million. And because uh, they recognize the needs of that sector is slightly different than traditional um, uh, members of finance, they invited someone to be a part of the leadership team who uh, comes from the nonprofit sector. And so my role is to sort of see where the gaps are, advocate for them internally, and then so help build the ecosystem in our partnership communities. Thanks. Um, what about you, Patty Talman? Good morning. Everyone. Good morning, everyone. I'm working. Yeah. Um, it's been a great experience to be here. I'm working for Community Futures Development Corporation, one of 63 in the province of Ontario. We're mandated to lend to businesses in, in Halliburton County. And with that, we provide uh, mentoring support, business counseling. And one of the things that we do best is lending. Um, we also provide support to not-for-profit organizations in different avenues. One of the biggest things that we do, which is very important to our community, is um, provide non-repayable contributions as grants, as a lot of people would refer to. Um, also provide them with um, consulting services, guidance, strategic planning, and strategic planning in the communities, and one of the focuses is job creation in our county. Great, so I think you can see what they've done here. Uh, 21st century leadership on the stage, um, a diverse group uh, playing important roles in building up the sector. Um, I want to uh, just, you know, unpack the description. We're talking about innovation, we're talking about 21st century leadership. So 
just to use a tweet form um, and something that you can all tweet out after you, uh, you hear these responses, um, tell us in the length of a tweet, like what do you mean by innovation and how that for you relates to leadership? And I'm just gonna get people to volunteer themselves to answer this one. <laughs> I'll go. So, um, focus on making businesses, organizations, and communities more adaptive, effective, profitable, and sustainable by creating new wealth, new jobs, and contribute to economic advancement. Awesome. And use the hashtag Econew. Go ahead. <laughs> so, for me, I, I really enjoyed this question. I, I think uh, innovation is about experimentation, trying new things, and most importantly, taking risks, being creative, and then of course, safe space to fail so you can learn from those uh, challenges. Thanks. Bianca? Yeah, really similar. Uh, to me, innovation is about finding new and effective ways of doing things. It relates to leadership in that both require an interest in changing the status quo and embracing failure. Uh, pour moi, l'innovation au niveau du leadership, c'est uh, de transitionner d'un leadership qui va être plus perçu comme individuel vers un leadership qui va être collectif. Uh, sur mon leadership collectif, c'est un leadership qui va engager les personnes uh, parce qu'on peut percevoir souvent le leadership tout seul comme étant potentiellement dangereux uh, si ça enlève le pouvoir à d'autres personnes que celui qui le prend. Great. So we're starting to get a picture here. Um, there um, is risk. There's the, the willingness to fail. And there's a relationship between the individual and the collective action. Um, experimentation, and so with these tools, with, with this sort of like toolkit for leadership, it'd be great to get a, a, like a picture. If you could paint a picture of the kind of change that you're trying to like build in the long term for us, um, I think we could, because you have such, you sit in diverse uh, spots, we could really start to paint a picture of what our collective future might look like. Who's, who wants to volunteer to give us a picture first? Julien? Donc, je pourrais me lancer à l'eau. Euh, donc, selon moi, le thème aussi de, de la conférence de, de ce panel, euh, le leadership au 21e siècle, une des premières questions qu'on devrait se poser, c'est c'est quoi le leadership du 20e siècle? Parce que si on veut élaborer sur qu'est-ce qu'on fait de bien aujourd'hui, en 2019, et qu'est-ce qu'on pense faire de bien euh, au courant de ce siècle-ci, on doit se poser la question, qu'est-ce qu'on veut changer par rapport à ce qui se faisait avant? Selon moi, il y a plusieurs éléments qui nous apparaissent comme naturellement des choses qui sont à changer. Par exemple, on peut percevoir le leadership du XXe siècle comme un leadership qui va être très hiérarchisé, où on va avoir une personne qui va être au sommet, qui va donner des commandes à d'autres personnes, et ces personnes-là vont tout simplement répondre à la commande. Ceci, au XXe siècle, était conçu peut-être comme du leadership. Aujourd'hui, on voit plus ça comme étant de la direction hiérarchique. Alors, comment est-ce qu'on fait pour changer ça Une des façons que je vois, puis je l'ai mentionné dans mon précédent point, c'est de voir comment est-ce qu'on peut stimuler le leadership collectif au sein des personnes. Et ce n'est pas un exercice qui est facile parce qu'il y a des personnes qui naturellement vont se raccrocher à des personnes qui vont avoir euh, une motivation ou qui vont être des locomotives dans certains projets. Pour leur faire prendre conscience de ceci, selon moi, c'est de regarder quelles sont les compétences des différentes personnes qui sont les parties prenantes et de miser sur ces compétences pour faire prendre conscience aux personnes que chaque compétence est nécessaire à l'avancement d'un projet, d'une initiative, d'un programme ou tout simplement du développement d'une collectivité. Leadership collectif, pour moi, en ce sens, c'est clé. Euh, donc, encore une fois, de voir comment euh, on développe et on élabore sur le leadership des différentes personnes et pas seulement son propre leadership. And we should be conscious of the generational question here, too, something that you raised before. Do you want to just uh, tell us, tell everybody how you responded to this idea of 21st century leadership when we had our pre-meeting? C'est vrai. Donc, effectivement, on a eu, on a eu une rencontre préliminaire avant ce, avant ce panel. On a eu l'occasion de discuter par téléphone avec les différentes personnes ici. Puis une question qui, qui m'est qui m'est apparue comme essentielle, c'est de dire, mais moi, dans ma génération, le seul leadership que je connais, c'est le leadership d'aujourd'hui, c'est le leadership du 21e siècle. Ce qu'on décrit ou ce que je perçois comme étant le leadership du 20e siècle, qui est selon moi peut-être un peu toxique, un peu euh, un peu différent, euh, c'est pas quelque chose que j'ai jamais eu à vraiment expérimenter. Et donc le leadership que je construis avec mon équipe, que je travaille dans les communautés, c'est un leadership qui, selon moi, est euh, justement implanté dans le 21e siècle. C'est la seule chose que je connais. Yeah, so get ready for generational change, everyone. Um, who, who would like to go next with the picture of the possible future that we're working for? I'll go. Great. Yeah, and I'd, I'd lo I loved uh, what Julian was saying about changing the hierarchical structure and more from like a, a personnel perspective. And I think expanding on that to like changing that structure for organizations, especially 
coming from nonprofit and now in finance, like recognizing how institutions can represent ivory towers, and I think flipping that hierarchical structure to make them more accessible. So, a vision, if I'm going to actually paint a picture, I would say things like putting social workers or community development workers in financial institutions in, in branches of banks or like making things more accessible would be a big dream for me. Great, thanks. Bianca? Yeah, I can share. Uh, this is, I think, pretty core to our model at, at Green Economy Canada. So the systemic change that we're interested in creating is, is tackling climate change. Uh, we've been told in uh, no uncertain terms that we have about a decade to limit global average temperatures to 1.5 degrees Celsius or face a pretty bad future. And so we're really focused on how do we uh, engage particularly the business community in being a part of the solution um, to some pretty rapid changes that we need to make. Um, so kind of building off of what uh, Julienne and uh, Alia were saying, when we look at the traditional approaches to addressing this issue, we know that they're not working. Um, for years and years and years, we've depended on high-level governments to act and felt hopeless when that hasn't happened. Um, and what we're seeing now is really a shift and a need to shift to grassroots distributed leadership on this issue. So if I can share an anecdote of what that looks like um, so you can visually see how that's happening on the ground. Uh, Ten years ago in Waterloo Region, a group of people got together uh, they were extremely frustrated by year after year of failed international negotiations on climate action. And what they did was started a nonprofit organization called Sustainable Water the Region, founded on the premise that business that sustainability was in business's best interest and that communities and businesses could lead on local climate action. And so they brought together the municipalities, the academic institutions, the private sector, civil society, and talked about how they could co-create a local solution to get businesses voluntarily setting emissions reduction targets and reporting on the progress. That program, the Regional Carbon Initiative, is the foundation of the program that we're trying to scale across Canada. It is a social innovation. And in five years, that program had engaged the equivalent of 14% of the local workforce in voluntarily setting and achieving these targets and reporting back on progress. And why this is such a really a neat example of the value of sort of grassroots leadership is that while this initiative started with sort of one very concrete goal in mind, we need to get uh, emissions reductions, it had so many co-benefits. So these businesses that were a part of this network now had built trust and partnerships. They were now sharing and learning. Uh, there were conversations happening across sectors. And this has now created a beautiful ecosystem in water the region where the community is primed for more transformational change and businesses, municipalities, academic institutions are all working together to talk about a brighter, bigger future. That's a very uh, different kind of outcome than we might have seen from the more traditional styles of leadership top-down mandated. Great, thanks. Patty, from your perspective, what's a picture of the future? I think that a lot of the things that we do as CFTCs in our communities is we lead a lot of organizations. Um, a lot of businesses and organizations rely on our input, but our leadership. So I think um, giving the, the knowledge and abilities to how they can adapt to innovation, but incorporate it as well. So I think we do that through providing the funding to the different businesses and organizations, but the leadership is one of the key things, but collaboration is another. Great. Um, so we've had um, an illustration of a possible future, uh, some pictures painted. Put up your hand if you heard like something that, that really resonated with you, like collective leadership. Does that resonate? Grassroots leadership, bottom up, community driven, um, innovations that are like are being developed in place by people with uh, you know, a, a defined problem and a, and a desire to, um, and an urgency for change. Great, um, and I think it's important to reveal that what we're gonna be doing for the rest of this panel is less telling you how you should think and more seeding the conversations we're going to um, be uh, going into afterward. So with that in mind, uh, we decided to actually bring to you some questions. So my next question to all the panelists is sort of like, Letting your curiosity guide you uh, without purporting to be you know, an expert telling this room of experts uh, how to think and what they should do, but drawing on your rich experience, which you've already outlined. Um, 
do you have questions about what we would need to strengthen grassroots leadership to achieve the kind of systemic change that you've already outlined you'd like to see in the future? Like what questions about how to do that better do you think we could generate or, or, or sort of curiosities or, you know, you can also make affirmative statements. It's, there's not gonna be any grading here, so. Go ahead, someone want to jump in? Yeah, Julien. Uh, C'est une question qui est très, très intéressante, puis uh, je, je vais être un peu uh, peut-être uh, direct et brutal dans mon approche, mais il y a plusieurs choses qui, selon moi, sont importantes de mentionner autour du leadership. Déjà, de un, il y a une confusion qui est de plus en plus uh, présente dans nos communautés où on perçoit le leadership comme de la popularité. Mm -hmm. uh, puis on voit popularité sur les médias sociaux, popularité de toutes sortes de façons différentes. Puis on perçoit ces gens-là qui ont, par exemple, beaucoup de, de followers, etc., comme étant des gens qui ont du leadership, alors qu'en réalité, c'est quelque chose qui n'a absolument rien à voir. Puis ça, ça va être important pour nous, euh, comme personnes qui sont justement dans, présentes dans les différentes communautés, de mettre l'emphase sur le fait qu'être populaire sur les médias sociaux ne veut en rien dire euh, qu'on a du leadership. Ça décrit plus un besoin de validation, souvent plus qu'autre chose. Et c'est quelque chose qui peut être une pente très glissante. La deuxième, la deuxième chose que je perçois, comme un danger autour du leadership et que je vois malheureusement trop souvent dans les communautés, c'est la complaisance. Quand je parle de complaisance, c'est souvent l'auto-félicitation et je réalise que ceci souvent ne nous amène nulle part. Donc on va avoir tendance à participer à des activités, être sur le devant de la scène, etc., porter une vision tout simplement et se faire féliciter pour toutes sortes de choses, se dire à quel point on est fantastique, fabuleux, magnifique, alors qu'en réalité, on fait juste suivre notre vision. Ce qui me ramène à parler du fait que la vision est primordiale dans le leadership. Et c'est pour ça que je crois sincèrement que toute personne peut avoir du leadership pour si peu qu'une vision qui soit appropriée à son parcours de vie, à son expérience, à ses propres capacités, euh, puisse être façonnée. La vision, selon moi, c'est ce qui porte de leadership. Euh, et n'importe quelle personne ici dans cette salle a du leadership, probablement plus que nous ici. Et c'est pour ça que souvent, je, je m'égosie à dire, lorsque je participe à des activités comme ça, que ce n'est pas sur le stage, ce n'est pas sur la scène qu'il y a de l'expérience. Oui, il y a une certaine expérience, mais la réelle expérience ici, elle est dans la salle, parmi les gens que je vois en face ou que je vois mal à cause des lumières. Euh, mais parmi les gens qui sont dans la salle, c'est ici qu'il y a un leadership réel. Okay, great. So a critique of 20th century leadership and a vision looking forward. And, um, you know, this is a peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunity. So um, Julien is calling all of us peers here. Um, someone else want to talk about the kind of curiosities or questions or that, are, that they're bringing to the idea of strengthening grassroots leadership? Yeah, this is a, a really important question for us in our work um, because we rely on community partners to uh, launch and grow these hubs that help local local businesses. So when we think about what's the next community that can support a green economy hub, one of the core things we look at is trying to identify what are the elements locally that can make this social innovation survive and thrive. Um, and that's a really hard question sometimes to answer, to think about what are kind of the it factors that you would see in a community. Um, so one of the, the key questions that really guides our work that we're still trying to find good answers to is, um, for those communities that have really strong grassroots leadership, what were the ingredients for success there? Is it that, uh, you know, that community had just a, a bunch of really great entrepreneurs or an entrepreneurial spirit that led to uh, really strong initiatives taking place? Uh, or is it that there was some support from the municipality or funding or programs that allowed that um, uh, to be cultivated? Um, I think really understanding that would help us uh, if we think about the importance of grassroots leadership and accelerating the change that we need to see, knowing what are the underlying factors that support that I think is a really important question to think about how we can get more of it across Canada. Great. Go ahead. Uh, I would add volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> some some questions that I would pose would be, how do we continue? And I always go back to this, like making a safe space. Maybe it was my time in the nonprofit sector, but how do we cre create this safe space for people to test things? I think so. Similar to what Julian said, like breaking down the idea of experts or thought leaders. I mean, that's really popular right now, but putting that back in the you know, the, the common or the people and, and having the opportunities for them to speak up. How do we create that moving forward? Yeah, it, interesting. We're going to hang on to that idea of like the expert and the thought leaders when we move into our next conversation. But before we hear from Patty, I'm going to start 
warning the four of you to think about, if you have a question for each other, not warning you, inviting you, um, if you have a question for each other to like, you know, to jump in because I think that, that would be really valuable. So, uh, so Patty, from your perspective, um, are, you, are, you, are you bringing any questions here? No. <laughs> I was more interested, I was more interested in what you guys had to say about this because I did not delve into this question and yeah. sort of, but I was more interested in what you guys had to say about this, which was very informative. Um, being leaders as we are, um, I think this gives us some thought perception on how we can certainly continue to lead and be innovative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that it's a kind of a hard question, right? So we're, we're trying to open up space for grassroots leadership. Um, having, if we had all the solutions, it would probably sort of be already seated. And it's really, it's really great that you had, like, that you wanted to hear from your co-panelists. And I think uh, Alia might have something to, yeah. to. That just reminded me. I remember in our, in our previous pre-discussion, it came up that someone had said, maybe it was Michael, had said, um, where do you see yourself in the movement? Like, think, uh, where do you see yourself? And that could be you your, as an individual, your organization, the, your sector, but where do you place yourselves when you do like a bird's eye view in, in the movement of what we're trying to accomplish? And I thought that was so interesting because I don't often take the time to consider that perspective. And so that might be a good question to pose to the group. Yeah, and for maybe for like going forward, like we're all different kind of movement actors. We have different roles, different functions, but Wow, when you add it up together in a room like this, it's mu it multiplies in its power. Um, so following up on that, um, there's also the kind of like leadership that happens within organizations and within um, the general community of organizations or the community of interest that you operate in. So how do you um, cultivate that leadership? Um, how do you support the people that are emerging um, that are around you? Is that a practice of yours? Anything to share around that? Yeah, go ahead. We um, hold a strategic planning session annually with our board of directors. And the nice thing is that our board is very active in our communities and their respective communities. So we have broad representation from all over the county. Um, giving them the ability to be able to lead in the community, or act on behalf of the corporation, is beneficial for us as a leader. We work with not-for-profit organizations, assisting them with strategic planning processes. Um, we have staff that sit on municipal committees that <clears throat> help them strategize, as well as the end result is a lot, often our staff will submit or fill out on their behalf um, applications for funding. Some of our board members, I say, are heavily involved in different facets of the respective communities, but that creates the awareness of our organization and what we do, and hence increases our ability to help the business community and not-for-profit organizations in our, our area. Great, thanks. So the network is really powerful, it sounds like. Um, anyone else? Euh, je pense quelque chose qui est, euh, qui, est, qui est très important ici, si on regarde le leadership au niveau de notre propre organisation, euh, je dois vous dire que cette année, dans mon cas, euh, je suis devenu directeur général du Conseil de la coopération de l'Ontario au mois de janvier euh, de 2019, puis ça a été une année d'apprentissage et pour moi et pour le reste de l'équipe. Euh, et si vous demandez des témoignages à certaines personnes dans notre équipe, ils vous diront qu'il a fallu bien s'accrocher euh, au courant de l'année 2019 parce que les changements sont arrivés comme un tsunami sur l'organisation. Il y a eu beaucoup de changements qui ont été opérés en même temps. Et ce que j'ai fait, c'est que je me suis assuré d'engager les personnes dans ce processus-là. Ce que je fais, c'est que deux fois par an, euh, il y a des consultations sur le contenu de notre plan stratégique avec les membres de l'équipe, pour que ces personnes-là puissent avoir une rétroaction directe sur le travail qu'ils ont ensuite à accomplir. Ce que je fais aussi, c'est de m'assurer qu'il y ait une diversité des talents au sein de notre organisation. Euh, je sais que notre organisation, dans le passé, était perçue comme une organisation qui pouvait être très masculine. Euh, ceci a changé complètement, puis on a atteint la parité absolue au sein de notre organisation. De la même façon, j'ai peuplé notre organisation de personnes qui, parfois, n'ont pas des personnalités qui sont compatibles avec la mienne, parfois n'ont pas des personnalités qui sont compatibles entre elles, mais je m'assure que les éléments de notre plan, qui est un plan qui porte une vision de toute façon, puissent être répondus par les meilleures personnes pour y répondre. Et dans certains cas, ce sont des personnes qui ont une diversité de connaissances qui va être euh, telle que ça peut créer des conflits entre l'organisation qu'il faudra régler de part après. Et c'est quoi le résultat de diversifier l'équipe? 
que, uh, dans le travail, la, avancer la mission, c'est quoi l'effet L'effet, tout simplement, c'est d'avoir différentes perspectives. C'est de réaliser, et puis ça, c'est à n'importe quel niveau de leadership qu'on ne connaît rien. Et à partir du moment où on sait qu'on ne connaît rien, on dépend de la connaissance des autres personnes pour avoir un fragment supplémentaire de connaissances. Et la raison pour laquelle je me suis doté d'une équipe, puis je, je dois reconnaître que l'équipe que nous avons dans notre organisation à l'heure actuelle est la plus talentueuse qu'on a jamais eue dans l'histoire de notre organisation, c'est parce que je sais que ces personnes-là apportent toutes une variété de connaissances, une variété d'expertise, une variété de parcours de vie et de façons de faire qui sont uniques à elles-mêmes et qui sont ce qui fait la richesse de notre organisation. C'est la diversité des talents qui est à la base de la richesse de notre organisation et qui nous permet d'atteindre la vision que collectivement nous avons définie. So, uh, intentionally diversifying the staff team, having, like, paying off for being able to deliver on your, on your work, on your mission. Um, anyone else? Go ahead, Priyank. Yeah, I was uh, going to say, so I think diversity of perspectives is really important in recognizing that people need, need to be engaged in different ways based on their backgrounds and their perspectives. Not everyone will contribute in the same way if approached in this, uh, in th through the same approach. Um, so would strongly support all of that. I think there are two key things that have worked um, really well in our organization and that I see as pretty critical as we're thinking about community-based leadership. So the first is understanding our bubble and knowing how to step outside of that. So whether that's in our own organizations, only talking to the senior leadership team and never asking the people actually doing the frontline work, what their experience is, what they think, how we should solve the issue, or at the community level, you know, talking to the same five organizations who show up at every meeting to address whatever issue there is in the community. If we don't actually start reaching out to the people uh, that our work impacts, um, our stakeholders, and um, having an honest dialogue, um, being willing to listen to what's working and what's not, um, and showing that their voice matters, um, we're not going to have their voice in decision making. And my experience is that people don't always need to feel like they are right, but they, need to, they do need to feel like they are heard if they're going to want to engage again. Um, the second thing that I have learned is that we really need to remove a fear of failure within our organizations and within our communities. Um, if people feel like they're going to be shamed or blamed or that they're going to be told that they're doing something wrong, why would you ever speak up? Uh, why would you bother doing anything other than the exact thing that you're asked to do? Um, so to the extent that uh, which, you know, we can celebrate the process, celebrate people raising their voices, working together, um, and be willing to take on smart risks and be okay with failure, I think that's going to do us all uh, a service in building more effective and engaged teams and in helping to uncover solutions that we need to solve these really big problems that we have. Great, thanks. Go ahead. Anna. Sure, I think we can definitely see that there's some themes here about, like, um, encouraging voice and expression and having diverse uh, perspectives on the same team. Like, I think uh, an organization like Alterna, recognizing that they want someone from the nonprofit sector is such a huge advantage and uh, demonstrates how open they are about really wanting diverse perspectives. Uh, and um, something that's worked, um, well, one of the best pieces of advice I got for me developing my leadership from my boss was he was like, make some noise. And I was like, that's amazing, yeah. Like, <laughs> just, it's so simple, but just like giving me the, the inspiration to do that and, and interpret that whatever way. I think I'd love to do that for other people. Great, thanks. Patty, any thoughts on this one? I'll add to what, um, interesting that you said is talent, talent in your team. Um, I'm very fortunate to be surrounded by a, a really good team of staff. Um, but the board of directors really adds to that as well. So I just I wanted to note that comment that you said. Um, so we've heard um, some sort of clues. Um, vision first, um, willingness to risk, uh, willingness to experiment, and a high tolerance for failure. Uh, diversifying the team to get the best perspectives. Also diversifying the voices that you're hearing. Um, listening to the front lines uh, staff in your work and um, also reaching out to the community and not the same actors or the same groups. How's that sounding? All right, all right, we've got some hand waving. Um, but real talk, okay, so is anybody willing to share um, a situation or an experience where that getting to that place has been hard or where you've faced a barrier or where, you know, that there's been challenges in the process? Because I think, 
I think you know we can be vulnerable here, um, and and the fact is that if you know there are there are also um, for you as leaders or for you trying to create this environment, um, it can't always be easy or as as smooth as you're making it sound. Yeah. Uh, je pense que c'est un très, une très bonne question. Puis euh, quelque chose qui, qui me fourmille un peu dans la tête, c'est euh, si je reviens sur les changements que nous avons accomplis au sein de notre organisation au courant de l'année 2019, je réalise que ces changements ont été euh, importants, ont été profonds et que ça, pour certaines personnes, étaient des changements qui les ont déracinés dans leur travail. Et ce que je réalise, puis ça revient un peu sur ce que ma collègue ici disait, c'est qu'il y a plusieurs aspects qui sont à prendre en compte pour réenraciner ces personnes. De un, il faut leur faire prendre conscience que les choses, on va les tester progressivement, puis on va voir si ça marche. Si ça ne marche pas, on va tester autre chose. Ça crée une culture de flexibilité qui est très, très importante au sein d'une organisation et qui parfois est déroutante pour des personnes qui viennent d'un système où on leur donne une tâche, on exécute. Autre tâche, exécution. Dans mon organisation, ce n'est pas on nous donne une tâche, on exécute. Si on a une vision collective, et je veux faire en sorte que les employés au sein de notre organisation, mes collègues de travail, mes champions, comme je les appelle, utilisent cette vision pour que ça devienne le véhicule de leurs propres intérêts. C'est-à-dire que je réalise que les gens au sein de notre équipe sont des gens qui sont passionnés, qui ont des talents, qui ont des expériences, et je veux qu'ils qu puissent canaliser ces expertises-là à travers la vision de notre organisation. C'est vraiment un peu une façon de voir le big picture aussi, de se dire, ce n'est pas vraiment ça que tu dois faire, puis ce n'est pas exactement ça que tu dois faire. Voici la vision qu'on porte comme organisation, voici la vision sur laquelle on va s'arrêter deux fois par année pour continuer à la développer ensemble. Mais à partir de là, je veux que toi, tu regardes qu'est-ce que tu es comme personne, c'est quoi qui t'anime, puis que tu puisses vivre ce qui t'anime comme personne au sein de notre organisation. Puis je suis convaincu que c'est quelque chose qui peut amener les personnes à rester beaucoup plus longtemps au sein d'une organisation. Mais comme j'ai mentionné, la limitation, c'est que c'est très déroutant pour des personnes qui viennent d'une culture organisationnelle où on est donné une tâche, puis on doit exécuter la tâche. Et s'il n'y a pas de tâche, il y a une vision et on doit la réaliser. Anyone else want to jump in here? Around challenges, barriers, and or like difficulties, or um, you, you can volunteer. There's no pressure here. Sure, <laughs> right. I can share one. I think uh, in the nonprofit sector, I think it can be quite challenging sometimes to think this way because we often face a lot of financial pressures and financial stresses. Um, in the nonprofit sector, it's really difficult to, uh, you know, have that kind of stability or certainty uh, to give, you know, staff job security or even be able to plan beyond a couple year horizons when we're depending on grant funding. Um, and so to try and balance um, what can sometimes feel like a scarcity mindset where the risk of failure is quite high with uh, what can sometimes be a slower process with more inclusive and democratic decision making and risk taking. Um, it can be tough. Uh, it can be really tough. And I think um, as we're collectively trying to think about how do we foster innovation and how do we, uh, you know, help scale things that can address some of these big problems, one of the big barriers we need to talk about, I think, is how we remove some of those, how we can provide a bit more financial certainty um, or, you know, social capital to say it's okay to take these risks or that we can start thinking about things beyond kind of the next one year horizon. Great. Go ahead, Patty. I think um, meaningful engagement volunteers takes a dedicated time and commitment. I think providing our board and our staff with the ability to learn, training, er, keeping them involved, it's, it's important to keep them engaged. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, just keeping that up, yeah. but that's being committed to it. Yeah, so you're already talking about um, sort of democratizing who has a role, um, demo like talking about uh, decision making, your modeling um, in your organization and your community, um, how to lean into a different kind of leadership. You're engaging um, people from the board to the volunteer level uh, and with the staff. Um, so, so that like takes us to, I think, um, sort of like a future-looking, outward-looking uh, question around uh, building even more space for leadership. Like, if we were to um, democratize, make more democratic and inclusive decision-making in general, in, say, in community economic development in the sector in, and the communities um, in which uh, everyone's operating, 
Like, how would we have to do things differently? Now, not just in your organization, but in general. Um, I also want to highlight, um, as, as you're thinking about that, that you've already talked about where knowledge is kept, and I think that's really important. The, where there's this tendency that we're all familiar with to talk about expertise or thought leadership, but that do really does separate um, the people that are living situations or dealing with frontline, uh, uh, in a frontline relationship with communities from sort of like this floating up here thought leader. Um, and I think it's come out really strongly that you think that, that you know, knowledge is actually very powerful when it's connected to the ground, when its feet are on the ground. Um, I definitely uh, heard that from Ted Howard um, very powerfully. So, so how do we make, what would we have to change or do differently in our collective work, in our sector, among our organizations, within our organizations? Um, if we wanted to make more space for leadership, if we wanted decision making to be more democratic and more inclusive. Um, déjà, je pense que c'est quelque chose qui va prendre du temps. Euh, on réalise en ce moment qu'on est dans une période où il y a un changement dans le style de leadership. Euh, puis même si je suis quelqu'un qui connaît seulement le style de leadership du 21e siècle, je vois des personnes arriver dans mon organisation qui ont vécu un autre type de fonctionnement auparavant. Et ceci prend de l'adaptation. Comment se fait cette adaptation? Évidemment, c'est en facilitant le fait, euh, en engageant ces personnes-là dans le processus de décision. Selon moi, c'est une grande partie de la chose, c'est de leur dire « tu as le pouvoir de changer les choses ». Euh, souvent, puis c'est quelque chose qu'on qu voit en fait depuis l'enfance, on réalise qu'on est formaté par, euh, on est assis dans une salle, un peu comme vous êtes assis dans une salle, puis il y a des gens devant qui parlent, qui parce qu'ils sont surélevés, parce qu'ils sont devant, sont plus importants. Même chose dans une salle de classe, on est assis dans une classe, il y a un professeur devant qui parle, cette personne automatiquement est plus importante. Puis cette, euh, cette espèce de propagande un peu de qu'est-ce que devrait être le leadership, ou ce à quoi ressemble ce leadership, qui est en fait une direction absolue qu'on force les gens à prendre, ce devient quelque chose qui devient naturel dans notre façon de penser. Et je réalise dans mon organisation, il y a des personnes qui constamment attendent de moi que je sois supervision, que je sois la direction, que je sois gestionnaire, que je fasse toutes ces belles choses. Ce que je leur dis en retour, c'est que voici ton projet, voici la vision de ce projet, mets tes compétences pour réaliser ce projet selon tes propres termes. L'essentiel, c'est qu'on arrive à atteindre la vision. Et je crois qu'éventuellement, on va arriver de plus en plus à une, forme, une société en général où on n'occupera pas seulement un emploi parce qu'on sait qu'on va exécuter des tâches, mais on va occuper un emploi parce qu'on sait que c'est dans une organisation où les valeurs qui sont portées par l'organisation concordent avec nos propres valeurs personnelles. Et je le vois chez nous, les gens qui sont là sont des gens pour qui les valeurs de notre organisation concordent avec leurs propres valeurs. Si ce n'est pas le cas, souvent, il va y avoir un départ euh, qui est malheureux, mais c'est des choses qui vont se faire naturellement et que j'encourage parce que je crois que les gens devraient travailler là où euh, leur cœur se trouve. Ça really résonne avec moi dans le travail que je fais avec les communautés et avec les organisations. Nous voulons parler de la vision vision first et nous avons parfois skippé la conversation sur les valeurs ou les principes pour se comporter ou la façon d'interagir avec les autres ou de se relier à les autres. Donc, je voulais juste. Sorry to insert myself um, as a moderator. Um, anyone else? Uh, a rapid chase there. I Go only ahead. have a couple of things um, that I wanted to mention on this is build on the time to create the leadership opportunities within your organization with the staff and the board, but within the communities that we lead. Um, show your appreciation, take the time to have fun and celebrate our successes. Great. Tell us more about the kind of, like, what, what you do um, when you're working with the board. Like, the, you've, you talk a lot about the board and the volunteers, and it seems to be a big part of the way that you're modeling in your organization or the investment of time. Like, what, what, what is it that, that drives that? How are some of the, like, the main strategies that you think are, are working well in that regard? So I think um, we have an investment committee that we review the loans with, and they're, it's constructed of um, the board of, of board of directors. So within that, we provide them the tools to be able to review those loans in a manner that is successful, but keeping them informed and giving them the proper information is, is makes, that, makes it successful. I think we have a CD working committee, again, involved with some of the board members, having that ability to provide them with while they review more than 50 applications 
for funding, so keeping them understanding on the processes, but the leadership that they can have a, a role in that leadership of those businesses and organizations that are being supported. Great, thanks, Alia. Um, one thing that occurred to me is that as we have more uh, corporations and businesses doing impact and demonstrating their values based, and then we have more uh, nonprofits and charities going social enterprise and, and operating as businesses, we come to this sort of gray space where everybody's kind of doing similar work but with and, and working towards similar impacts and outcomes, but with like slightly different perspectives. And I mean, there's challenges with that definitely about like who's funding it and who's, who's measuring and things like that. But at the same time, it's also really, I think, an exciting time and place to be looking at diversity. And like now we're actually seeing across sectors, diverse people coming together. And so I think playing off that and, and, and coming together with more opportunities to have events like this, but actually inviting other sectors would be a great opportunity to move forward and build the leadership. Before I go to you, Priyanka, is working across sectors important to you, like from like business, c community, um, uh, w labor, like is that an important factor for you? Yeah? They're, they're nodding their heads. C est, c est, si yeah. les compétences, à mon avis, du, euh, du 21e siècle, qui est essentielle, c'est la polyvalence. Yeah. Euh, puis ça, c'est quelque chose qu'on voit à travers toutes les organisations, c'est pas juste notre organisation, c'est qu'une personne doit être en mesure de faire une diversité de tâches qui peut-être n'a jamais été vue auparavant. Euh, Aujourd'hui, on s'attend à ce qu'on puisse être bon en communication, bon en politique, bon en rédaction. Euh, il faut aussi être bon sur l'exécution de projets. Bref, une capacité d'être de, 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 polyvalent qui est devenue essentielle. Yeah, and then the other element that you're raising, Alia, is like behaving or working with organizations that are m driving toward the same value base, maybe sharing a collective vision. Are we doing that enough across, you know, our, uh, like with each other? Should we do that more? Is that a part of the 21st century? Si je peux donner un exemple sur ça, euh, la réponse est oui, <laughs> euh, selon moi. Puis pourquoi? C'est parce que de plus en plus, je réalise que ce n'est pas toutes les organisations qui sont portées par une vision. Et je donne un exemple fracassant, c'est que parfois, dans des organisations, on regarde où est-ce qu'on peut trouver de l'argent, et après, on va peut-être identifier une vision ou une façon d'exécuter selon l'argent qu'on aura reçu. Aussitôt que je vois ça, je pars en courant. Je veux m'assurer d'avoir en face de moi une organisation qui porte une vision, de comprendre cette vision, de comprendre quelles sont les énergies derrière cette vision, et si je vois que c'est sincère, dans ce cas-ci, on va s'associer. Si ce n'est pas sincère et que la vision, c'est avoir de l'argent et peut-être plus tard faire quelque chose, je pars en courant. And Priyanka, you raised the, the idea of um, decision making being more democratic. And so how, um, how do we do that? What would we have to do differently? How would we have to behave differently? Going back to, the, to that question. Yeah, I think there's two elements here. One is, I think for all of us, just to be mindful of the ways that we are interacting with others and to what extent those interactions are fostering or hampering um, people speaking up and being a part of the process. Um, and I think uh, for me personally, I can say it's been a journey. I don't, uh, I don't know anyone that is perfect at it, but I think if all of us as leaders, um, you know, leaders of our organizations or leaders of our community can be uh, thinking in that mindset and have an eye to continuously improving and bringing more voices into the discussion, I think things will start to improve. Uh, the question about working across sectors, um, I absolutely think that that is essential. I, uh, there is nothing that any of us work on that is solely, uh, you know, an us issue. Um, everything is interconnected and interrelated. Uh, and if we are not talking to one another and working towards a common vision, um, we're not using our resources effectively, we're not getting to where we need to be, um, and yeah, we're certainly not modeling the kind of leadership that we need to see in the 21st century. And one group that we don't often think about um, activating or connecting with as a sort of uh, shoulder to shoulder are the people that we serve, you know, the people whose lives we're trying to lift up or improve. Um, you know, is that a piece going forward in the 21st century where people who are currently needing our assistance actually become a constituency that can mobilize a base for like longer term change? Is that something worth considering at this stage? Euh, juste pour réagir sur ça, en fait, il faut faire attention avec le mot « assistance » ici. 
Euh, parce que souvent, ce qu'on réalise, puis c'est quelque chose qui, qui se voit aussi en psychologie, euh, c'est que lorsqu'on va donner trop d'assistance à une personne, qu'on va faire preuve de trop de leadership vis-à-vis d'une personne, on va retirer à cette personne le pouvoir de prendre ses propres décisions. Et donc, de ce fait même, on peut retirer à une communauté le fait de prendre ses propres décisions si on arrive avec des décisions qui sont déjà toutes prêtes. Il y a un exercice qui prend du temps, qui doit se faire. Et je dois vous dire que d'un autre côté, lorsqu'on développe des coops, des entreprises sociales à travers l'Ontario, on réalise que ce n'est pas créer des documents constitutifs, ce n'est pas faire l'incorporation, ce n'est pas créer un budget qui prend du temps. Ce qui prend du temps, c'est de développer au sein de la communauté une vision commune, un leadership commun, où les gens vont se dire « on a collectivement le pouvoir de faire ceci ». Et pour ce, que, ce que ça prend pour faire ça, c'est de soi-même se retirer de ce rôle de pouvoir-là, de ne plus de décloisonner, puis de déconstruire le fait que parce qu'on vient de l'extérieur, parce qu'on part sur le stage, on est perçu comme la personne qui a l'expertise. Il faut le déconstruire pour dire, je ne connais rien, je suis là pour vous faire prendre conscience à vous dans la salle que vous avez l'expertise et que vous allez très bien fonctionner sans nous. Anyone else? I think... Um lived experience is definitely a critical piece like we have to acknowledge that and we have to find ways to make be more inclusive of that in any capacity essentially mm -hmm. i would go even further so i mean if you're when we go back to thinking about there's you know such a big focus on diversity and inclusion within organizations why did, why should that matter to a business beyond the fact that people are telling us that it should matter Um, and this idea that the more our organizations can reflect the communities that we serve, the better able we're going to be to, uh, you know, make good decisions, uh, make the right products and services that are, are going to be effective, impactful, taken up. Um, so there's just from a business perspective, a strong business case for diversity where we want to be incorporating those, those perspectives and engaging people whom we impact because it helps us make better decisions and helps us do our jobs more effectively. So um, I think we've heard that um, hierarchy busting or questioning is a piece of this, um, thinking expansively about who our people are, um, and then being leaning into the risk um, of experimentation, um, challenging where expertise lies, and um, making sure that we're shifting, I heard the word pouvoir, power, um, which I appreciate very much. Um, Just you know, we're we're going into conversations now for the, the you know the remainder of the conference, and I think it would be really great to to hear from you, sort of like if you either something that you heard from each other or both, something that you heard on this panel that popped for you, um, and if you if you could tell people like sort of a a, a thought or a recommendation or a question to carry into uh, the the design session, um, what would that be? So something that popped for you, um, if you have something uh, that comes to mind. And the second question is like, what would you like to, what message would you like to give to this great crowd as they move into the next phase of the conference? C'est juste un élément, c'est, euh, selon moi, c'est impossible de mentir sur la vision. Et parfois, les visions qui nous sont partagées ne sont pas des visions qui sont sincères. Alors, ce que je demanderai aux personnes ici, c'est de vous poser la question, est-ce que la vision que vous portez, que vous partagez avec les autres personnes, est sincère Si cette, si cette vision-là est sincère, elle va être naturellement contagieuse. La personne à qui vous allez partager la vision va croire dans cette vision, elle va y adhérer, et c'est ainsi que va s'opérer un transfert de leadership de la personne qui possède la vision vers la personne qui va commencer à croire dans la vision que vous lui partagez. Donc ça, c'est toujours essentiel de, de, de faire ça, selon moi, et de regarder que ça ne soit pas orienté vers soi-même. Je vous donne un exemple concret. Parfois, les visions d'organisation, c'est « je veux me développer comme organisation ». Ce n'est pas une vision qui est contagieuse. Moi, ma vision, puis c'est la vision que je partage avec mon équipe, c'est « je veux que notre organisation se positionne dans la création d'un meilleur Ontario ». Je veux qu'on soit sur tous les dossiers chauds du moment qui vont nous positionner pour qu'on crée un Ontario à notre image qui va être un meilleur Ontario plus progressiste. Ça, c'est la vision qu'on partage et c'est la vision dans laquelle on peut instiller dans notre personne en leur demandant « Toi, comme personne, je sais que tu as des compétences dans ça, ça et ça. Je crois que tu serais très, très bon pour participer à cette vision. » Et de ce fait, la personne va faire émaner son leadership pour dire « Effectivement, je suis prêt à prendre euh, les devants pour participer à cette vision-là. » Go ahead, Ali. Uh, I would say my uh, input for going into the design session is just to be as creative and to take those risks that we're talking about, plan, don't be afraid to think big or small, whatever you know your heart's taking you. Go ahead, thanks. 
Yeah, I just really appreciated the opportunity this morning to sit down with all of you and, and hear your perspectives and see how, uh, despite working on, on different things, there's some common threads there around the importance of diversity, painting a compelling vision that others can get behind, um, hearing from people on the front lines. Uh, it's, yeah, just been really, really nice. Uh, the question that I would leave people with is to think about uh, in what ways is a fear of failure holding you, your organizations, or your communities back? And what might need to change to make you more free? Great. And Patty? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, it was interesting, a comment that you made that um, you have organizations that create a plan that will fit the funding that is available. That was an interesting concept because in, in our community, we have lots of funding opportunities for organizations to acquire funding and that's happened and you say like run. It's, it's challenging to be able to support those kinds of individual organizations that do that just because the funding is there. Um, I think that if we support our community involvement in the development of our leaders, we can create more community engagement I think moving forward to have a community champions and be more successful in accomplishing our goals. Excellent. So um, we're, the challenge to you is to be vulnerable, uh, to uh, lean into risk, um, to um, think about whether there's a sincere vision that isn't driven by funding, but by actual the longer term change we want to make, um, a picture of a better world. Um, and you know we've had you've been very generous with each other and and sharing your experience. Um, thank you for that. I hope that you all feel that you've got some juicy stuff to take with you. Uh, I certainly I certainly do. And I think that the the idea of for the 21st century of erasing the walls, um, the hierarchies a little more, um, inviting more people into the change we have to make um, to lift people up and to re like build relationships really um, with the people that were in our organizations, outside in our communities, and attending to that in a way that's inclusive, that values diversity of perspectives and voices. I find that I'm taking that forward and I'm really grateful for that. So uh, Paddy Talman, Ali Abaya, uh, um, Priyanka Lloyd, and Julien Germy, thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for listening.